The Colrum, episode 42, Revenge of the Chair. Let's burn through that. To the coal room, which we've already introduced, episode 40. number 42. <laughs> and the revenge of the chair refers to two things, but the second thing we'll get to at the end of the episode because it's related to the squad. Uh, but the first one is. Hashtag kickbet. Yeah, hashtag kickbet. England got on the wrong side of the TMO, which is a chair based thing, <laughs> chair related thing. So, <clears throat> I was England, watching. I was watching that game. I was avidly there. I was, for once, I was supporting New Zealand because I just wanted England to get thumped. And they led 15 all at one I know. I was, I was very upset. And, <laughs> you know, when it's the first time that I'm actually rooting for New Zealand and not the other team, um, that New Zealand is going to give me a scare like that. Well, they still showed their class and they still won the game. And to all those naysayers who said that the English player was not offside, in actual fact, Nick Mallett and the whole team in the studio presented the facts. So, we're going to prove this to you. Player tackles New Zealand player, goes to ground. He forms the base or the baseline from where the English players have to fall behind. He did not. He ran alongside that line and then still stepped over the threshold before uh, Perinara picked up the ball to kick it. Now, there might be some English supporters out there that say that because no England player was contesting the ruck, there was no offside line. Now, let's think back two years ago to a very famous Six Nations game, which Italy used that kind of tactic very well with malls and rucks, that they didn't contest them, so therefore no offside line. And as a result, England had a little hissy fit. Yeah. And what happened? Well, rugby changed the law, so it exactly. came to bite them in the ass. Yeah, suck on that. Yeah, exactly. New Zealand showing the class, winning the match, England on the wrong side of the TMO. Yes, or technically or the right side, because World Rugby will come out and make a comment about an offside rule. Yeah, that's not, not a dangerous tackle. So, according to World Rugby, the call was the correct call. Yeah. Oh, and the fact that the French referee referred it to the TMO, that's perfectly legal. If he can't make a decision on field, the TMO is allowed to. Sorry. Suck it. <laughs> Which brings me to the second match. Wales beat Australia. Oh, we knew that was going to happen, but yeah. that was just bad captaining from Michael Hooper. There were many kickable penalties that he should have mm -hmm. taken, even one towards the end of the game, which would have at least tied the scores. Yeah. But he went for the corner instead of posts, and it just didn't work out. Nope. Uh, Wales were very gritty that whole match. Defensively and uh, offensively, they were really there the whole time. No scoring games. So it dragged. I mean, I must say, the training game is essentially that. Um, TMO decision and uh, referee, well, the TMO didn't even get into this one. The referee in that uh, late charge on uh, half penny regarded as perfectly fine as momentum. Yes, it's momentum, but it was late and high, and the player is now out with concussion. World Rugby, this is two weeks now. But also at the same time, if you go to the Springbok games, it was a very similar incident with uh, Faf de Klerk on, um, I forget his name, the French player, and that was technically momentum as well, mm -hmm. but it was still kind of blown. Yeah, but look, the penalty, look, the ref didn't even give a penalty for the, for the yeah. Wales Australia one. He at least penalised Faf for his late charge. Which brings us to Le Heart Ache. Le Heart, heart Attack. The Heart Attack. My heart palpitations. Watching that game, uh, sorry, South Africa versus France. It's just we're, we're, not, we're, we're done with Australia. Australia. We're done with Australia. Um, oh, side note: they slipped to seventh in the world rankings, which is one of the lowest they've ever been ranked. No, they've, um, always, they've been. No, they, they the moved world. up to six after the previous weekend. Now they dropped down um, again. Yeah. Um, so I lost my train of thought. A so, hard palpitations. There we go. Yes. Watching that game. Let's put it this way. When you have the ball, mm -hmm. and you want to play with the ball, mm -hmm. that requires you to keep the ball. Mm -hmm. I mean, basic, basic, like a, a three-year-old figures this out, right? Yeah, basic rugby law. You want to score tries, you keep the ball in hand. In fact, 
in the first half, I could count the number of times that the centers got the ball. Jesse yeah. Kill and Damien and they touched the ball three times. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, what happened every single time Puff picked up the ball? Kicked it. Every time. Aimless kicks. Yeah, up and unders. All the time. Apparently contestable. Not really. So, it wasn't a great game. No. Handling errors galore. Um, but we could blame that on the conditions. It was raining. Or more well, than raining, it was pouring. Um, oh, look. We didn't have a lot of handling errors. Every time we had hands on the ball, the decision was made to kick it for territory. Now, I wouldn't say we're necessarily rugby experts here, but in wet conditions, you kind of want to protect the ball into short space and kind of work the ball instead of kicking it and kind of creating not really much chance for you to get the ball back. I think of all Fuff's kicks, there was one that I thought was, yeah, that's a fairly decent territorial game, but it happened while we were in the French half and we were attacking the 22. Which isn't exactly the smartest decision. Uh, added to that, South Africa did not protect the ball on the ground. The no. French were, were dominating in the breakdown, turning oh, over. Oh, you got 120 kilograms. <laughs> Center. Center. No, eighth man running in the no, clearing don't, area. Don't yeah. forget about Pastoral. Yeah, but that's... Isn't that the F man? No, he's 13. No, no, yeah, that guy. He, he looks more like a prop than a centre. Yeah. Um, so, in that sense, South Africa need to really work hard because mm -hmm. Scotland are going to come at them hard. Um, especially this resurgent Scotland, Scottish side. Um, they performed very well in the Six Nations. Mm -hmm. um, they beat England. They beat England in the Six Nations. They, they are thumped Fiji. They did very well last weekend. 54-17. Um, so, really... They are going to be coming up all guns blazing. Uh, a lot of South African flair in their team as well, with mm -hmm. good old Josh Strauss named on the replacements. Yeah, Who CJ remembers St Josh Strauss in his beard? Yeah, yeah. CJ Stunders in there too. Um, and Hugh Jones. We are all, all very familiar with Hugh Jones. Technically not South African, but having Played gone to Stormers. university in South Africa and playing for the Stormers, he, we claim him. Yeah, we claim him. Which brings us to our team that's going to be playing the Scots. Uh, Two injury changes, uh, Warren Whiteley and Ivan Etzebeth not considered for this week yep. for various injuries. In so fact, Warren is Whiteley being thrown home. Yeah, so that changes the back three on the scrums, which we'll get to now. But uh, our, our favourite bench warmer this year, who, who had a case of the uh, Alistair Kutia time of uh, Bongia manami itis uh, sitting on the bench tonight, Ambrose Papier finally getting a start. Finally, uh, yeah, Faf de Klerk being released to his um, Premiership club, the Sale Sharks. Not sure the exact reason why. I mean, a lot of South Africans will probably say it's because he's useless. Um, <laughs> other people <laughs> might have it. Might, other people might have a different opinion. That's not valid. Um, but Papier getting his first start, Fancel on the bench. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the shift in the back three, we've got um, Dwayne Fumunen moving from seven to eight, and Peter Steff moving from five to seven, where um, he has been rampant. Where he's been really good. I'm surprised Rusty hasn't played him there yet, mm -hmm. but that means Archer Sneeman comes into the starting lineup, uh, partnering with Franco Mostert and Lord de Yaga on the bench. Yeah, so. Our starting 15 will be uh, the rear at fullback, Sabun Corsi at uh, right wing, Jesse Krill outside centre, Damon Dialendi inside centre, up here with Yante left wing, uh, Andre Pollard uh, far half, Embrace Papier at scrum half, Vermeulen eighth man, Peter Steff to toy, flank, Siakalisi captain, other flank, uh, Franco Mostert, Arches Neyman, our locks, Malheba, Malcolm Mox, and Kitzel for an unchanged. Uh, front row. So yeah, I think uh, that's it's pretty me. powerful pack. Uh, we're definitely going to front up to the Scots, um, but you know they they have a very good coach. Yeah. Um, him and Rossi go back a long way. Yeah, especially um, with the Pro 14 yeah. and, and that. So they know each other's style. So it's really going to be quite a quite a contestable match. It's going to be a hunting, especially because uh, Scotland has been playing well. I mean, yeah. this is going to be a real test for us. So Rossi is not really taking much chances here. So it's going to be um, five versus six in the world, uh, Scotland being number six. Mm -hmm. And then the arguably the most exciting game of the weekend, if you're a neutral supporter, is Ireland versus New Zealand. Uh, yeah. One versus two in the world. Really, we've been waiting for this for a while. Um, ever since last year with the mm -hmm. upset in Chicago where Ireland beat New Zealand. Yeah. Um, 
so maybe we'll see something there. Ireland's been playing phenomenally, yeah. um, uh, but again, it's New Zealand. But we could argue that in the last few games, New Zealand have not been up to scratch. No. Considering if we look back at the 2017, 2016 seasons, where if New Zealand didn't win a game by 20 or 30 points, it was a bad game. Yeah. Now, if we're looking at the last few games, lost to South Africa, yes. win by two points to, against South Africa, barely scraping a win against um, England. England, and then, I mean, getting 30 points put on them by Japan, yeah. that's very uncharacteristic yeah. as well. So, this could be Ireland's chance to actually really prove that they are top contenders going into the 2019 World Cup next year, but we will have to wait and see. So mm -hmm. I'll leave it to Dax for the score predictions. Okay, so are we going to start with the New Zealand Ireland game? Yes, we'll start with that game. Okay, so as much as we want to go, yay, Southern Hemisphere, Ireland. This this time I'm going to revert back to my tradition and going uh, everyone yeah, against yeah, New, Zealand. New Zealand. So Ireland, I think if they can pull what they did in Chicago last year, dominate New Zealand's pack stifle their, their backline ball, I think uh, it's going to be Ireland by, I'll say, Squeaker. 7 points. Yeah. I'll say it's a 7 point game. And then um, South Africa versus uh, Scotland? I am going to say South Africa, and I'm going to say maybe by a healthy 12 points. And whoever Australia are playing? <laughs> I'm going to go for whoever's playing Australia, There we go. quite honest. Yeah, um, they're not playing well, and I think uh, they really need a real reassessment before next year's World Cup. So yeah, that's it for right. today. Nice, another quick video. Um, don't forget to like for Hoot, um, mm -hmm. and like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and you know the drill, the little bell icon by Dax's knee. Um, you can just click on that to get an email notification of when this video is uploaded, and future yeah. videos. Yeah, so... Uh, Enjoy your rugby weekend, guys, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Yeah, cheers. Bye.